Hello and welcome to today's webinar on finding family history in library catalogs. My name is Ginevra Morse, Director of Education and Online Programs at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be moderating today's event. We are a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer such programming for our members members and friends around the world. Our presenters today are Metadata and Digital Projects Librarian Trenton Carls and Library Collection Services Manager Ann Marangolo. Trenton is responsible for cataloging library materials and making digitized books available on the library's digital collections website. His previous experience was at, as the technical services librarian at the Chicago History Museum. Prior to the History Museum, he received his MLIS from Dominican University, also in Chicago. Ann Marangolo oversees the acquisition, cataloging, and preservation of our library's collections, as well as the integrated library system and online catalog. Ann joined the staff in 2013 and was previously a librarian at Simmons College and the State Library of Massachusetts. So libraries are truly teeming with published and unpublished resources about your ancestors' life, places they lived, and their family. In the next 50 minutes or so, we, we uh, will discuss how to approach any library catalog that you may be unfamiliar with. We'll demonstrate some best practices for using our very own American Ancestors online library catalog, introduce or perhaps reacquaint you with other go-to catalogs, and generally teach you how to start thinking like a librarian to find the resources that you need. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type your question in the panel to the right of your screen. We'll address those at the end. There is no handout for this presentation, but we are recording this event and starting tomorrow, you can easily go back and review any of the content um, from this presentation on our website. So if you miss something on today's first listen, don't worry. You can always go back and review the content later. All right, so without further ado, I will now turn things over to Trenton. Great, great. thank you, Geneva, for the introduction, and thank you all for joining us in today's webinar. I'm Trenton Carls, Metadata and Digital Projects Librarian. Uh, in a bit, I'll be passing the mic to Ann Marangolo, Library Collection Services Manager. Uh, today, we're gonna talk about using library catalogs in your genealogical research. I hope that you'll come away from this webinar with a better understanding of how library catalogs are constructed, what they contain, and best practices for searching. Uh, we will look at any HGS library catalog and a few other helpful catalogs to use. So to begin with, what is a library catalog and why do we have them? First, these are the goals of a library catalog. To enable a person to find a book or other item for which the author, title, or subject is known. To show what the library has by a given author or on a given subject or in a given kind of literature. And finally, to assist in the choice of a, new, a book, a newspaper, manuscript, or et cetera. While these may, may seem basic, these rules were actually laid out almost 150 years ago by a man named Charles Cutter, and they're amazingly still relevant today. But really put simply, a catalog helps to serve as an inventory of a library's contents. If you had four books, you would know exactly where those four books were, and most likely what they were all about. But if you had 4,000, which some of you may, could you say the same? A library catalog helps organize our information and makes it more accessible and discoverable. Catalogs can contain all types of items in a library's collection, such as books, journals, manuscripts, and special collection items, uh, even electronic materials, photographs, newspapers, and really whatever else the library has as part of their collection. Each title will have its own record, which was created by people working in the libraries to describe the physical properties of the item and the subject matter of the item. And before we go on, let's talk a little bit about the difference between a library catalog and a genealogical database. So databases such as those on AmericanAncestors.org or Ancestry.com uh, are record-based. They're focused around data such as names, dates, places, um, Vital records uh, and census records are examples of those, like this on the right here. Um, they're common examples of information found within a database. 
A database is created from original sources, such as a book from our library, though as mentioned, sometimes those databases can be hyper-focused on a specific volume or even just a section of the book and are usually only focused on pulling names and exclude other information in a book. All this is different from using library catalogs where you probably won't search for your ancestor's exact name, as Anne will explain shortly, but rather for materials that may pertain to them. Materials found in libraries can supplement the records you find in these other types of databases. So this item on the left would be found in a library catalog and would probably give you a history of the census and how it was conducted, but your specific ancestor is probably not going to be mentioned in this publication. So like this census book shows, uh, you may not find your specific ancestor's name in the library catalog, but you may find them in context and you may gain valuable information about the circumstances of their lives. So I've laid out six examples here of items that you'll find in a library's catalog. Uh, the first is ancestors and descendants of George Rufus Brown and Alice Nelson Pratt. So if you have an ancestor in this family, wonderful. It'll provide a great narrative of that person. But if not, this type of publication, this type of published family history is a great source of information about a time and a place that may parallel your own ancestors. Uh, this book, Avon, Connecticut, a historical, a historical story, uh, which will give you local histories, uh, detailed information about your town uh, and the ancestor, where your ancestors may have lived. Uh, a register of the children of the family of Joseph Whitney Jr. Uh, containing their names and ages, time when born, when died, what disease died of, etc. This item uh, represents another type that you'll find in a library catalog, a unique manuscript item. The genealogist handbook for Irish research. This is a how-to manual for your research with resources available to you. While it won't have your ancestor's name in it, it will guide you to the best sources available. Here we have the annual register of Albany directory for the year 1816, uh, including names of residents in Albany in 1816. Since in a catalog record we can't list every name that's in this book, uh, you can use this type of publication to verify if your ancestors were living in a specific place at a specific time. Uh, and lastly, you have a map of Boston and the country adjacent from actual surveys. You can use historical maps to see the landscape at the time your ancestors lived there. Catalogs can also list photos, arts, and other miscellaneous items. So now that we know what a catalog is, what about the action of cataloging? And how is a catalog record created? Years ago, cataloging was taking this, the actual book or other library item, and turning it into this, a catalog card. A catalog is made with the three rules we discussed earlier in mind. To help a user find that item, catalogers like me take as much information from the item, in this case a book, and we'll put it on an actual 3 by 5 card. We have the author, the title, the publisher, and even a few good subject headings at the bottom there. Armed with any of these pieces of information, a user could navigate a catalog to find this book. But where do we find the info? So almost all the information that goes into a catalog record comes from the item itself. There are some cases where a cataloger may need to do some outside research to fill in some gaps, but almost everything you see comes from a few specific areas. Uh, an individual cataloger can catalog thousands of books a year, and contrary to popular belief, we don't actually read the entire book. Despite this, we have a few go-to places that are sure ways to get a clear picture of the item. First, the greatest source of information is the title page shown here on the left. This title page gives us the full title, which sometimes actually isn't printed on, uh, in its entirety on the cover. Uh, which edition it is, here we have the second edition. What year it was published, 1989. Um, and where, actually who it was published by. This we have, uh, it's uh, published by the author, Lauren Sathy. And it was published in Houston, Texas. The image on the right at the top here shows our contents page, which gives us a better breakdown of the book, including names of places, families included. And the bottom half also gives us knowledge that there are images throughout the book, so the cataloger doesn't have to spend time flipping through the entire book to find out if there are any included or not. 
So obviously putting all that information on a small three by five note, note card had its drawbacks. Cards could get misfiled or taken. There's only so much space to put a lot of information. Searching took a lot of time. The cataloger could have terrible handwriting like me. And most importantly, you had to actually be in the library to see if they had the book you were looking for. In an online catalog, we have as much room as needed to put as much information as possible to help library, library patrons find their book from anywhere in the world. In this version of the book and card catalog we've just seen, an online catalog has allowed for extra space to put a note for the book that says it includes an index. It also has a full listing of the table of contents and even more family names than could fit on a note card. All of these things would not have been able to be found on our print catalog because we'd run out of room. And I won't bore you with the details of what goes into making all the words appear on the screen as organized and easy to use as they are, but here's a quick behind the scenes look at the codes and fields used to create an online catalog page. It can actually be a little bit of fun. So while the way we've cataloged has evolved, the standards and required information are still applied. Things like who the author is, who published it, when it was published, how big it is, uh, and if there are pictures in it, they're all in the record. But now with online catalogs, we have room to put more information that would fit on a paper card catalog. And as mentioned, whenever possible or whenever helpful, we'll add even more things like the summary off the back of a book, a table of contents, and especially we'll list a large number of family names that are mentioned in the book. So besides simply transcribing the information that I just mentioned, a cataloger's job is also to analyze the book to figure out what the main subjects in the book are. For a book titled Captain George Athey of Galway in Maryland and his descendants, it's pretty easy. Athey family, Galway, and Maryland. But catalogers have to be careful to choose the right subject heading to make sure that all books around the country with that same subject can be linked together. For consistency, the Library of Congress has created authorized subject headings that catalogers should reference before adding these headings to their record. So the Athey family referenced in my title is actually spelled A-T-H-Y and is shown here at the bottom. Since family names sometimes change within a family over time, Library of Congress realized it was simplest to create a unified heading for minor variations of names to link together. So in this case, I would actually use the top 100 A-T-H-E-Y family. Uh, also of note, in this book, there are chapters dedicated to two branches of the family, the Stage family and the Talbot family. Because family history is our focus, we would add both of those names and really any more that we came across to the catalog record. So a person searching for either of those names would know that that reference existed in a book that otherwise may not be searched from title alone. Another benefit of using these authorized subject headings is they show exactly how to transcribe the heading. So Galway has Ireland in parentheses, which is consistent for all locations instead of common transcription of city, comma, county, or city, comma, state. So the last job of a cataloger is to take all the previous information, and specifically subject headings, and decide where the book should live, or rather, what other books should be its neighbors. This chart lists all the main classification classes of the Library of Congress system. Uh, after a quick glance, you may notice that it's uh, pretty easy to see that the majority of material in a genealogical library will be in C, D, E, and F classes. But obviously, not all books are about one thing. The cataloger's job is to analyze the book and also to see what their institution's all about to see what works best. So the top chart is a more narrowed in version of the C-class, which, which as we saw on the last slide is auxiliary sciences of history. Here we see that numbers in this range are for genealogy. The majority of books in our collection will be classified here. But back to my last point about books being about multiple subjects. So say I have a brand new book titled The Carls Family and the History of Morgan County. Half the book is about the Carls family and the other half is about the history of a small county in Illinois. Should I put this book with other histories of Morgan County, or should I put it with other books on families whose name start with C? Well, since I work at a genealogical library where the focus is family history, 
I would put this book with other genealogies that start with the letter C. Perhaps a local history library would choose differently and put it in the F class for American history. But if we've created a good catalog record, searches for history of Morgan County will still lead us to this book either way. So now that we've decided to put it with other genealogies, we turn back to the Library of Congress classification system to guide our creation of a call number. As discussed, anything with the prefix CS has to do with genealogy, and CS71 specifically is American family genealogies. And from there, we take the first letter of the last name, C, and use yet another calculated system to generate the rest of the numbers. So this book would have a call number of CS71.C375-2019. And also during your research, you will encounter uh, one other main form of library classification. And it's probably one that many of you grew up with in your school library. And that is the Dewey Decimal System. Dewey is the primary system used in public libraries. Uh, some academic libraries do use it as well. And the bottom chart here is just a small sampling of the genealogy classification numbers in Dewey. So if you're at any public library in America, you should be able to go to those numbers in the library and find genealogical material. So now that you hopefully have a better idea of what goes into making a library catalog and its records, I will pass things over to Ann Marangolo, who will explain the ways in which you can search these library catalogs to find everything you need. Thanks, Trenton. So now with some information on what makes up a catalog and how cataloging is performed, let's look at how to conduct some different kinds of searches and how to interpret the resulting records. We'll use the NAHGS library catalog to demonstrate, but these search techniques will apply to other catalogs and databases you'll come across in your research. Libraries house a wealth of unique family and local history materials that support genealogical research, but sometimes you'll have to do a bit of work to find out what they have. A library catalog is the tool you use to search for those items. It can help you locate a known item or discover valuable new materials on your subject. In the catalog, you'll find out about the items, the format, the subject, the contents, how to access them, are they online, in print, on microfilm, and what library owns them. Some things to keep in mind are that although librarians work hard to make their catalogs complete, all libraries may have some materials not in the catalog. Libraries may have different catalogs for different parts of their collections, such as for print materials or repository for digital items or another place for manuscripts, and some may still only have a card catalog for certain collections. Let's start our exploration with the NEHGS catalog. First, we have to get to the library catalog, and there are a number of ways to find ours. From the main page, from our main webpage, AmericanAncestors.org, click on the drop-down menu for library and choose library catalog. You can also go directly to the NEHGS catalog at library.nehgs.org from any computer, tablet, or smartphone. Clicking on any of the tabs along the top let you select the type of search you want to do. The default here, and in most catalogs, will be for a keyword search since it is the easiest and most general place to start. A couple of other things to notice on the main page. In the upper right corner is a button to log into the library catalog, and I'll talk about this in a bit, and a link to help pages. These links stay there as you explore the catalog, so anytime you need some help, it's right there. There are also search and drop down menus on the left of the top area that can get you started with a new search. Below the search area are links to some featured lists of resources like new items from the last months and related NEHGS resources. These are the six search types that are available in the catalog and correspond to the tabs we just saw on the catalog homepage. Which do you use? Well, it depends on what type of information you're trying to find. We'll start by looking at title and author searches. These are all browse searches. 
That means when you enter the first part of a title or author, the results you receive will put you in the alphabet locate, alphabetical location of a list or index of titles and authors that are in the library catalog. This comes from all the information in title or author fields of a catalog record. You can then browse this list for what you're looking for. These types of searches are best, known, are best for known item lookups. That is, when you already have information about a specific book and you want to figure out whether the library has it and where it's located. Note that when conducting a browse search, you do not need to capitalize words, you can omit the initial article, and you only need to type in as much as you think you'll need to put you in the proper alphabetical place. So let's look at an example. Here I've selected the tab for a title search and typed in what I hope will be enough of the exact start of the title. I'm looking for the book, The History and Antiquities of Every Town in Massachusetts. I've typed in history and antiquities because I always try to type in as little as possible. This list gives you a good idea of how browse searching works. You'll see the book I was looking for is at number 13. You'll also see the books around that title with similar titles in an alphabetical list. If, for example, the title of the book had really been something like the complete guide to the history, you wouldn't find it using this type of search. When I click on the title I'm interested in, we get the full record for the item. That is the complete information we provide for the book. Let's stop and explore this for a minute because there's a lot of potentially useful information here. The information at the top and bottom of the gray bar is generic information about the book. This information, or the metadata, is standard from library to library that owns this book. It shows author, title, and publication information. We also have the physical description of the book, the number of pages, the size, are there illustrations, pictures of your ancestor maybe? There also may be notes about maps, genealogical tables, or coats of arms. Make use of notes in a record to help ascertain more about the book and decide if it suits your needs. Here you'll learn that this is a reprint published by NAHGS of the original published in 1848, but with a new forward by Alice King. Also note in the summary, you'll see that there are brief biographical sketches of historic residents, so this will have town histories and maybe some biographical info about an ancestor. An index in a book is also an important thing to note if you want to be able to easy look for, easily look for a specific person, place, or event in the book. Since we can't search inside print books, an index is the closest way short of reading the entire book. Finally, also note that all of the info in blue is hyperlinked for linking to related items such as all the books by John Barber or all the books with the subject Massachusetts History, Local. Author searches are another example of an index browse search. Most catalogs use the format last name and then first name. All items by that author will have the name in the same authorized format to bring all works together no matter how the author's name is written on the book. Note that an author can be a person, an organization, or a governmental body. The slide shows some example of author searches. Along with a primary author, contributors, editors, collaborators, illustrators, sponsoring organizations are all considered authors and recorded in an author field. These next types of searches, keyword, subject, and advanced, are useful for discovering resources rather than looking for a specific item. A keyword is a word or phrase that describes the main concept of a topic. As I said, keyword, a keyword search is good for starting out and is usually the default search in any catalog. You can start with words that generally describe what you're looking for, search, and then either narrow in on your desired subjects by adding more words, 
or broaden your search to include more items by taking a word out or trying different words to find the right combination. You can also use keyword searching if you don't know an exact title. Say you're looking for the Barber book from earlier. You know the book is by Barbara and it's about Massachusetts, so you can type in those keywords and see if you can find it from there. Here are the results of a keyword search for Cambridge marriages with the results sorted by relevance. Most databases and catalogs will default to sort your results by relevance, but they can also be sorted by date or title. And relevance generally means the number of times and where words appear in a record. Note that the icons on the left side give you a quick idea of the, the type of material it is. Item number two is a manuscript item. Generally, the icons will be easy to understand. So in looking at the results, ask yourself, did this meet my needs? You have works about Cambridge, New York, Cambridge, England, and Cambridge, Massachusetts. If you were just looking for Cambridge, Massachusetts, you'll want to narrow this search. You can modify this search by just adding another word, Massachusetts, and since keyword searching does not consider the order of the words, I just put it at the end. Each concept is searched as an individual word which must appear somewhere in the record. You can modify your search also by clicking on the Modify Search button, which will take you to the Advanced Search Options screen we'll look at in a minute. When we look more closely at one of the records from the results on the previous page, you can see your keywords appear in red, so you know why the record was retrieved. Looking now at the middle part of this record, the information around the gray bar, this is the information specific to our library. It tells you first that we have two copies of this book, second that you can link to an online version in the Hathi Trust Digital Library, which is one of the many great free digital libraries you can access, and third that we have an NEHGS database that contains this information in searchable form, and we provided a link to search that database in AmericanAncestors.org. The in the location area, you'll also see the call number we've assigned to the book. In this case, it's F74C1C4 1914. Clicking on the call number will show you a list of books as if you were doing a virtual browse of the shelves of a library, except it will include the books from different sections, such as rare books or manuscripts that also have that call number. Our catalog, and most others, will have an option for advanced searching. Advanced searching will be especially helpful when you're looking in a large catalog, like the Library of Congress or the New York Public Library, or if you're looking for something very specific. You can start out with an advanced search or use the options to, to refine your search and results. This is what you see when you either click on the advanced search tab or select to modify or limit a search. The top section will do a keyword search in the field you specify from the drop-down list of title, author, or subject, and below are options to limit by the collection, research library, manuscripts, online, the material type, print, maps, manuscripts, by language, or by date. You can fill in any or all of the fields. Although searching and limiting is available in all library catalogs you may come across, it may look or be referred to differently. In this example from the Boston Public Library, your options are on the left and you can apply search filters by selecting the boxes for the filters you want to implement. The terms filter, edit, or limit your results are ones you have also seen in your database searching. Catalogs may look different, but they do tend to operate with the same ideas. There are bibliographic records with specific coded fields that you'll search through browsing or by keyword, and then other coded information in the MARC records Trenton showed earlier will help you limit by things such as date or format.
Finally, let's look at subject searching. Librarians are very careful to assign appropriate headings to items to help them be discoverable and to meet the needs of their specific users. They scan books to find main topics of an item which may not always be revealed through the title. Subject searching can often lead you to precise results since like items should have the same subject headings. This searches the LC Library of Congress headings that Trenton talked about earlier. In our catalog, we especially recommend subject searching for searches about a particular family name or a particular place. It's sometimes hard to know the exact subject heading since they are structured in particular ways and sometimes use vocabulary you might not think to use. The recommended strategy is to start with a keyword search and when you find a record that fits, look at the subject headings. Headings are hyperlinked in records so you can just click on them and get the other records on that subject. This example is of a search to see what published genealogies or manuscript items we have for a family, something I'm guessing many of you will be doing. Searching for a family name in this way, you'll find works where the family is the subject, not just records where a name happens to appear in, say, the author's name or the publisher, but may not really focus about the family. You will also find works where your family may not be the main focus, but there, are still, there still will be relevant genealogical information about them as an allied family. In, at NEHGS, we have over 30,000 published genealogies, so this will help you find the ones you can look at further. To do a subject search, go to the catalog homepage and click on the subject tab, and then you type in the surname of the family followed by the word family, as I've done here. This won't always happen, but I want to point it out to you. It's an example of how authority headings work in a catalog and why they are important. Here, we get the message directing us to use the Athe family with an E instead of without. Using the authorized heading in the catalog brings variant spellings together, so you don't have to search all versions of a name as you may need to do in a genealogical databases. Of course, it doesn't imply a right or wrong way to spell a name. This is another way library catalogists try to make searching as efficient and effective as possible using controlled vocabulary. To carry out this search, click, simply click on the blue Athe family link. The search results show five items, the first one being a manuscript item. This is a manageable number to look through, but for some more common names, you might have hundreds of results, and you may need to think of a way to modify your search to get at your branch of the family, perhaps by looking for a geographic location also. Here's a full record for the book, Captain George Athey of Galway and Maryland and his descendants that Trenton talked about earlier. And here's the subject heading for the Athi family, as well as many other families and geographic subjects. All of these can be clicked on for related items. If you look in a general library for this book, you may not find subject headings for all the other families. This is one of the things that we hope makes the NEHGS catalog unique and helpful for your genealogical research. So those were some of the basics for searching our catalog. And remember that this searching knowledge can be transferred to other catalogs you use. Let me mention a couple of other helpful tips for searching. Quotation marks around words, search them as an exact phrase. You may already do this for Google searches and it works in catalogs also. Wild cards are for when you don't know exact spelling or wanna be able to get a variation of spelling. Words can be truncated either at the end of the word. A star is open-ended and will retrieve records with words starting with mass, like Massachusetts also. Inserting a question mark will replace a single letter and retrieve Anderson spelled with an O or an E.
You've done some searching in a library catalog. How do you save what you're, you've done and organize your results? Most catalogs will have some tools that will help in this regard by letting you make lists, email records, and create accounts to save your research results. Let's take a look at how this works in the NEHGS catalog. The tools in the NEHGS catalog are the email, print queue, my lists, and preferred searches. The email print queue allows you to email, print, or save records while you are working in a catalog session. This doesn't require any library catalog login, but the information is only saved for the current session. To add from a results list, click at the box at left of a title, and then click Add to Email Print Queue up top. You want to add to the queue before going on to the next page of results. You can also add to the queue from a full record display using the gray button at the top of the page. Along the top, you'll also see buttons to view and clear your queue. When you're ready to view and export your saved records, you use the view queue button. This is what the list looks like, and you can print or email this list to yourself or to someone you're working with. The next two tools require you to log into the library catalog. If you're a member of NEHGS, you'll be able to do this. In the upper right corner, you'll see a catalog login button. Here you'll enter your last name and member number. If you have any questions about your member number, you can inquire with the NEHGS membership departments. Check off the records the same way we just saw. And in this My List function, saves records permanently in your library catalog account and allows you to create multiple lists for different research areas. We recommend this for use when you're preparing for a visit to NEHGS, as you would then be able to log in and access this list on site. Remember, searching a library's catalog is always advisable before any visit. Click on the drop-down menu to select a list, and you'll have an option to select an existing list or create a new one. To view all your lists, click on My Account, My Library Account, which is up top. This is the contents of my list on Irish genealogy. You can delete an item, move it to another list, or export the list for email or printing. One other tool is to save preferred searches to your My Library account. This can be set up to send notifications when a new item meeting your search criteria is added to our collection. After conducting a search you liked, click on the Save as Preferred Search button. You can be alerted when a new item with your family as a subject is added, for example. More information about using these tools is available through the catalog help pages. The search techniques and tips I just showed from our catalog can be used in other catalogs you'll encounter, from large institutions to small local history societies. Next, I'll show a few of the larger catalogs that genealogists regularly use. WorldCat is the world's largest network of library content and can be thought of as a shared catalog. Since 1971, WorldCat has been cooperatively created catalog of materials held in more than 10,000 libraries worldwide, including public, academic, state and national libraries, archives, and historical societies. These libraries have cataloged their regular collections as well as many special collections. There are over 2 billion library holdings for more than 400 million cataloged library items in WorldCat. You can search many libraries at once for an item and then locate it in a library nearby. 
This is the main screen of WorldCat. It starts you out with a keyword search for everything. Below the white search box, you'll see where WorldCat has their link to an advanced search. And the tabs above let you search only books or other formats. To the right of the search area, you'll see where you can create a free account for saving records and lists. Here's one example of when you may use WorldCat, aside from just looking for materials on a subject. Say you saw a book announced in NEHGS's weekly genealogist newsletter and you want to read a copy. WorldCat is great for that. You can go to WorldCat, search for the title, and see if a library near you owns the item. Since WorldCat has so many items, this is a place when you really may need to use some advanced searching tools. Here we search for the book Puritan Pedigrees, the new book by Robert Charles Anderson. WorldCat shows, that, shows all the libraries that own this book in your local area showing up first. Notice the bibliographic information at the top of the screen. This will be the same information that we have in our catalog, since this is an example of shared cataloging. One library will create a record and add it to WorldCat, and other libraries will indicate that they also own the item. If you're searching from, say, the north of Maine, WorldCat shows that this book is owned by the Bangor Public Library. If you click on the name of the library, you'll be taken to their catalog. You can also type in a zip code and see where a book might be. And here is the record and information from the Ursus catalog, which contains the holdings of the Bangor Public Library. Here again, you can see a combination of shared information about the book and local holdings information. Their copies of the book are either checked out or for use in the library only. Many thousands of libraries are in WorldCat, although many thousands of libraries are in WorldCat. Not all participate, since the records primarily come from libraries that use their shared cataloging services. If you'd like to find out if a library is listed as a WorldCat participant, you can search the WorldCat registry. From the search drop-down at the top left of the page, you can select Search for a Library. Doing this will also help you find some information about the library, such as location, phone numbers, and their web page. As with the NEHGS catalog, you can save search results once you create an account. WorldCat is free to use, and I would recommend checking out this resource. Next, we'll look at Archive Grid. Archival material and original records can be invaluable to your genealogical research. Some libraries will have their archival and special collections materials included in their general catalog, as we do, and some in a separate catalog just for the archives or special collections. Archival materials are unique and will only be available at that one repository unless it has been digitized. Archive Grid is a source for searching these collections. It contains over 5 million records describing archival materials. These can be original documents containing information about your ancestors, such as personal papers, family histories, family Bibles, and more. With over 1,000 different archival institutions represented, ArchiveGrid helps researchers look for primary source material held in archives, libraries, museums, and historical societies. Many of the records are included in WorldCat also, but there are also collections from repositories that would not be included there. This is the results from a search on the Jenison family, and you'll see records from diverse institutions such as the American Antiquarian Society, the Indiana State Library, and New England Historic Genealogical Society. Since you never know where you'll find information, here's an example of something you might find in a place you might not think to look. The University of North Dakota has a collection of Jenison family records, 1630 to 1991, 
with ties to Massachusetts and perhaps the Mayflower. At the bottom, you'll find a link to finding aids and an inventory of the collection. If you can't make it to North Dakota, most libraries and archives will have some service to make photocopies of materials for you. Family search. I'm sure most of you have searched family search for records. When you search family search for records, you're searching only those records that have been indexed, meaning that the records have been looked at and all relevant names, dates, and places have been pulled out and added to a searchable database. But many more records and other materials are available in different ways through the Family History Library. There may be browsable image collections, microfilm, or print and digitized books. These collections would be found through their catalog. To find the catalog, first click on search at the top of the home page, and then choose catalog from the drop down menu. This catalog works a little bit differently from others we've seen as the default search is by place name. As a side note, remember the family search microfilm you used to order and then go to an affiliate library or family history center to view? Here's where you can find them now. If you have a film or fiche number you have from a reference, a citation, or that you've used before, you can find it by clicking open the film fiche number search option and in inputting the number you have to pull up its catalog entry. Here we've done a place search for Windsor County, Vermont, and are looking at all the results, including the expanded land and property records section. To look at a full record, I've selected Guardian's records. There's a general description at, it, at the top and notes tell you where the orig original materials are held. The film digital notes section towards the bottom describes the contents of each microfilm reel and how it may be accessed. On the far right under format, the icon shows a camera for the digitized images you can use from home. A microfilm reel indicates that it's not available view, to view online, that it's still only on microfilm. In some instances, you'll see a third type of icon in the format column. Blown up, a key is visible above a camera. To view these, you may need to be at an affiliate library or a family history library. This means it is available online, but with some restrictions. As this material is moved from film reels to digital, record owners need to give permission for access as their rules and local laws permit. This is why everything may not be freely available from home yet. In this example of a digital book, there will be a link to get you where you can see the book. You may also note that in about 2014, the Family History Library added all of their catalog holdings to the WorldCat database, so you'll find in WorldCat many of the same items you'll find here. Some other ideas for catalogs you may want to explore at some point, the Allen County Public Library in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and the Newbury Library in Chicago both have large genealogy and local history collections and other resources for genealogists. The Library of Congress has millions of books, recordings, photographs, newspapers, maps, and manuscripts in print and digital format, as well as guides to using their collections. The National Archives for record collections, maps, photos, and other government information and guides. Historical libraries for local collections in an area. Small societies may have catalogs online, but may not be part of WorldCat, and they may have their own cataloging standards. University libraries. Special collections departments have yearbooks and other information if your ancestor was a student there. It's always good to check with a university library to see what's allowed due to privacy policies. And finally, the library catalog of any library you're considering visiting. So finally, you've searched a catalog and now you want to access some materials you've found. Here's some tips for doing that. 
Always remember if you're visiting a library, you want to check their catalog before you go and make sure the items are available for use. Look at the library's website for special information about collections, accessibility, and hours. Some small libraries may only be open by appointment. You can always call, send an email with your questions, use a library's chat service, or even contact them through Facebook or Twitter. Librarians love giving guidance about their collections and want to be there to help. The most direct way to obtain materials is to visit a library. As I said, before visiting a library, you want to check the library's webpage. Here's a page about our library, and you'll find information on using the library, databases available at the library, and about using our special collections. You should know in advance the hours, or if it is a restricted item and how you can get it to use. Plus, you'll find links to their online catalog and if they have any other catalogs. For example, here you can find a link to our digital collections. If your library doesn't have the material you want, you can try Interlibrary Loan. Interlibrary Loan is a service where a patron of one library can borrow items that are owned by another circulating library. The user makes a request with their home library, which acting as an intermediary identifies libraries with the desired items, places the request, receives the item, and makes it available to you. It's also a service that many people use for obtaining journal articles. Since we at NEHGS are a non-circulating library, we don't participate in this service. To use this, I would recommend going to your local public library. Even though that library may be small, they can still obtain a wealth of resources for you to use. Libraries will also have services, either pay or free, where you can order photocopies of some portions of books, or a photograph or other materials from the collection. If you're interested in the NEHGS photocopy service, you can find out more of this by clicking on the services section and choosing photocopies. This page has a request form and outlines different costs for photocopies. When requesting photocopies from a library, it's always good to have as detailed a citation as you can get, title, author, pages you want, and to conform to your request to abide by any copyright limitations. Any questions on the NEHGS photocopy service can be sent to library at nehgs.org. Finally, there are many items available digitally, and libraries continue to add digital items to their collection, including items that are digitized versions of print materials and items that are born digital. Always check for a link in a library catalog for a digital version of a book or visit one of the many digital libraries that exist, such as Internet Archive, Hathi Trust, or the Digital Public Library of America. Here's our digital collection site where you can search for or browse our materials. Our library catalog also has links to all of the items in our digital collection. So, I hope that we've given you some useful information to better understand, search, and use library catalogs. To review some key facts, search a library catalog before visiting. Start with a broad keyword search and narrow down from there. Leverage subject headings. Check worldcat.org for holdings near you. And finally, try to think like a librarian. Thanks for your attention. All right. Well, thank you, Anne and Trenton, for your fantastic presentation. So uh, let's see if you have any questions. Uh, go ahead and type your query into the panel to the right of your screen, and we'll try to get to as many as we can in the next couple of minutes. Um, so Anne, a question for you. Uh, PJ asks, is the NEHGS catalog only available to paid members? Or is it also open to guests or even just non-guests, just users of the internet? Uh, thanks for that question. The NEHGS catalog is available for anyone to use at, like I said, library.nehgs.org. Um, and most catalogs will be open for you to use. The only restrictions in our catalog will be if you want to either log into the catalog or view some of the restricted digital images that we have. But otherwise, um, to just view the materials and find out what's available on your family or your subject, um, yeah, we'd love to have you just uh, visit it and look around. Great, thank you. And Julie asks, and 
just to clarify, um, again, Anne, this is a question for you. Um, can you save catalog searches using the email slash print option if you are not a member of NEHGS? So can you just kind of clarify um, those tools that you discussed and if you have to be a member? Right. So the way the NEHGS catalog works is that we have two different ways of saving um, items and generating print email lists. The one that's called the email print queue is for anyone to use. You don't have to be a member or log in. And that search will only be saved during the session that you're working in the library catalog. Um, the my lists option is the one you would log into and there you would create the same types of lists but they would be stored permanently in your library account. Thank you. And uh, Trenton, a question for you. Um, Michael asks, so when you're reviewing the catalog search results, is there kind of an easy way to see which books or items have been digitized versus those that are maybe only available in print uh, physically at that library? Yeah, thanks, Michael, for that question. Um, and it's a good question. Uh, every library and every catalog is going to be a little bit different, um, but most places are now going to the feature of creating a link from the catalog record to the digital item itself. So in ours, um, you will see in the middle of the page um, that, yes, there is a click that says, yes, online. You can click to see this, whether it be in our own digital collection that we've scanned it, or it'll send you to a place uh, like, like Ann mentioned, like Internet Archive or Hathi Trust. So most places are at least showing um, that if you're good at navigating the catalog, you'll also be able to see, um, you know, if the item that you're looking for has a digital record. So you can save yourself a step and just look at it online. Thanks. And uh, Anne, um, you know, you mentioned Hathi or Hathi Trust. Um, Trenton just mentioned it as well. So Kathleen asks, um, you know, how does one access that digital library um, and how does it work? So those um, digital libraries are made up of generally freely available uh, books that have been digitized by a number of different libraries and they contribute their digital records to those collections. Uh, one of the big places they got them was from something called the Google Books Project that happened a number of years ago. Uh, and so you can just locate them by typing in um, the URLs for them and that might be something that uh, we can get um, some information to you afterwards so you can uh, take a look at them but you can also just type in the names of them to a general search browser and you'll find those collections and they're going to be as long as the books are um, out of copyright they will be free to use free for you to use Great, and I can certainly include links to a number of digital libraries in my follow-up email to everyone attending and everyone who's registered uh, for this program. Um, Trenton, another question for you. So Sarah asks um, or says, you know, you, you discussed the kind of the subject, Library of Congress authority subject, and um, I think you showed level 100 was kind of the approved or authoritative surname spelling. Is that a resource that individuals can see and access to maybe view how libraries maybe have um, have spelled uh, those surnames and is that maybe a good step for genealogists to do and to check out? Yeah, Sarah, thank you. Another great question. Um, it is available to anyone to use and uh, Ginevra can send out that link as well, but for you it's authorities.loc.gov. Um, and you know, you can definitely use it and it can be advantageous if you want to do some of your own record keeping. Um, but, you know, part of the reason why it exists is for us catalogers so we can kind of do the groundwork for you. And, you know, all that is to say that just because we're using these, you know, unified 
subject headings, that does not mean that you won't be able to find the material if you don't know them. So, you know, say in the instance that I used of um, Galway, Ireland, you know, if, if you do a search for that uh, in, in a keyword search in any of the catalogs, you'll still get a result that includes Galway and Ireland, and then you can actually just scroll down to the bottom of the record, and you'll see that, that authorized form uh, in the subject headings. And then once you click on that, it'll take you to all of the records that has that same authorized um, subject heading. So, you know, a keyword search will get you started, and then you can just continue to kind of go from there. Thank you. And maybe just a, a few final questions. Um, so, Anne, a question for you. Is uh, WorldCat, is that a subscription service? Do you need to create an account? Is it free? Um, what, what's kind of the access for that, uh, for that website? So the WorldCat database is... Um, worldcat.org is free to use. Um, it's supported a lot by the libraries that use it for their cataloging services, and that's where the records come from. But the public part of it is, yes, free to use, and um, the tools that they have um, do allow you to create a free account that you can save your records and things like that. All right, great. And um, one final question, um, and maybe Anne, this is one for you. Can you mention briefly um, a way that you can kind of virtually browse a shelf? Can you talk about, you know, why you might want to do that? Uh, maybe the pros and cons of kind of browsing a shelf virtually through a catalog uh, versus um, in person? Sure. Um, thanks for that question. So in our library, for example, we have materials in a number of different locations. We have books in our general collection, which is the collection that you can just walk up to and look at and f go to the section for your family and find books there. Uh, we also have a, a rare books collection that is limited, so you wouldn't be able to just go and browse it. Uh, we also have books that are available um, some genealogies that are online only. For example, a family has given us um, their genealogy that they publish, but it's only in electronic format, but it still will have a call number. Um, so anything with the call number, no matter where it's physically located in a building, will appear in one list if you do the virtual browse, shelf browse in the catalog. Thank you. And unfortunately, um, that's all the time we have for today. If we didn't get to your question or if you think of one as you start to maybe search our catalog or, um, you know, checking out the resources that we discussed today, feel free to email us at library at nehgs.org. And if you need more hand one to one help with your research, uh, you may consider scheduling a consultation with one of our genealogical experts or hiring our research services team. And you can learn more about those services by contacting the emails that you see on your screen. So thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center, AmericanAncestors.org slash education. I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.